Hello, and thanks for joining us today for our Seed World Strategy webinar, The Wiley Wireworm, an Unpredictable Pest. My name is Julie Deering. I'm the editor of Seed World Media, and today I'll be serving as your host. To get things started, I've got a few items that I need to make you aware of. For those of you on Facebook and Twitter, we will be actively posting using the hashtag StrategyWebinar. We'd like to encourage you to contribute to the conversation online. I'd also like to give a special thank you to our sponsor, BASF and Syngenta for their support. And a thank you, a special thank you also to our experts um, who will be who are joining us today. Kevin Warner, David Bellis, and Mitch Stam of BASF. We've not previously discussed wireworms, so this is a new pest for us to cover. And as planting season is getting underway here in the Midwest, the topic is very timely. This year presents another opportunity for research for university scientists and seed and crop protectant companies. So here's what we've got in store for you today. First, Kevin will provide an overview of wireworms, talking about how to identify them, their life cycle and management tactics. Then he will be joined by David and Mitch for a roundtable discussion. And we will wrap things up with a question and answer session for you, our guest. So let me welcome our first speaker, Kevin Warner. Kevin has been an assistant and now associate professor of entomology in the Department of Plant Sciences and Plant Pathology at Montana State University since May of 2008. He is also the extension specialist for cropland entomology. And prior to joining MSU, Kevin worked in applied entomology and integrated pest management in a variety of industrial and academic settings. At MSU, his research works to combine molecular biology tools with field research to provide solutions for insect pests damaging crops in Montana. Field research has the management of wireworms uh, from small grain crops, uh, which are an increasing problem in the western U.S. So Kevin, let's go ahead and dig in, shall we say. All right. Thanks, Julie. Um, good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you're joining us from. Uh, my name is Kevin Warner. As Julie mentioned, I'm an associate professor of entomology uh, at Montana State University. I started at Montana State University in 2008, and immediately I was called out by uh, local wheat and barley producers that uh, Montana grows a lot of wheat and barley um, because they were experiencing increasing damage to their crops from wireworms. Uh, so since 2008, wireworms have been a, a, one of the major focuses of my research, and Unfortunately, uh, one of the things that I've found is that wireworms are very resilient as a pest. So in this webinar, I'm going to cover how to identify wireworms, a little bit about their biology, the damage they cause, and uh, what we can do about managing them. So wireworms are the larval stage of click beetles. Uh, as, as a larval stage, um, they're, they live entirely in the soil below ground. And they can have a multi-year life cycle where they can live up to seven years in the soil before turning back to the adult stage. The adults are only present for maybe three weeks or four weeks in the springtime to mate and lay eggs. Wireworms are, the adults are also called click beetles because they have this unique mechanism. So if you're walking through your field in the spring and you see a small black beetle, maybe it's a quarter of an inch long and you, you think it might be a click beetle, uh, you can put it on its back. And they have this mechanism where they'll pop into the air and uh, you'll hear an, a very audible clicking sound. And it's a snapping mechanism that pops them into the air so they can get back onto their feet. So other than their distinctive shape, that's another way that you can identify the adult click beetles early in the spring. So click beetles are a diverse insect group. Uh, they're not a single species of the pest. There's, about nine, there's over 9,000 species worldwide over close to 900 species of click beetles in North America. And the point is, more than 30 different species are known to cause damage to crops grown in, in North America. So uh, again, I'm working in Montana, so I'm mostly working in small cereal crops in, in this region, and we have a distinctive distribution of species that will be different from the Midwest or the Southeast of the US, where there'll be a different set of pest species. And the biology can vary with the different species, so it, it, it is useful to know what um, species of wireworm is infesting your field. 
Uh, this is just an example of some of the different genera that are found in Montana. This would be just for Montana that has 150 different species of click beetles. Um, and we have more than six different genera. And this slide just gives you a little bit of an idea of the appearance of a click beetle. They all have a very similar shape, but their size will differ. Some are larger, some are smaller, and they'll, they'll maybe vary from light brown to, to dark black, and some species will have spots on, on their abdomen. And then within this group of, um, of different uh, genera, there's, there's several species within each genus that are able to uh, cause damage to small grain crops in Montana. So again, the point of this slide is a wireworm is not simply a wireworm. It's a, it's a complex of species um, that have different appearances and different biologies. And of course, we always want to know a little bit about the biology because it helps us inform management. Um, a few details about their biology. Again, it'll vary with the species, but there is a common uh, there is some common biology among the different species. In general, the adults are emerging from the soil early in the spring season. They're mating, and the females are laying eggs on the soil surface. But then those larvae require two to seven years before they develop back to that adult beetle. That means once you have wireworms in your field at significant numbers, you're likely to have them year after year. Um, some species, the, the, the two years would be the shortest life cycle. And what you'll find with some of those two-year species, they might kind of move around a little more in terms of you might see them in your field one year and then you don't see them again for three or four years because they have a shorter life cycle. But the species that are there for seven years, once you have a spot, you kind of know that that's your wireworm spot in your field. Two really important points about the biology of wireworms. The larvae eat almost anything. They can eat decomposing plant material, they can eat uh, seeds and germinating seedlings. And they, some of them will even prey on small little animals in the soil. And um, that means that crop rotation generally is not effective because they have such a, a broad feeding habit. They're, another point is that they're very tough. And I'll talk about uh, John Comstock uh, later as an example. But John Comstock conducted research on wireworms back in 1891. And he did a little experiment where he took a box of soil and then he had a box with wheat and then maybe a box with mustard to see what would happen to the wireworms. Well, he found that the wireworms that were in the box with just soil and no plants lived for over a year. So again, wireworms are, are very resilient. Um, they feed on a wide variety of plants when they are in the soil. Another important feature of wireworm biology, because they are in the soil for multiple years, they have an up and down movement. So in winter, they're going deep to avoid the, the freeze. And then in the spring, as the temperatures warm up, the soil surface warms up, they're coming up to feed. And after spending the winter, they're, they're pretty hungry. Um, then as, they, uh, as, the, as the summer progresses and the soil gets warm and dry on the soil surface, they will go deeper again to look for moisture. So a lot of up and down movement of wireworms in the field in response to soil moisture soil temperature, and soil texture. And that obviously varies quite a bit depending on, on which region of the country you're in. Finally, during the summer, when those larvae get large enough and they're ready to develop to adults again, they form the pupil stage in the soil, maybe two to six inches deep in the soil. And they'll turn into the adults during August or September, but those adults don't leave the soil. They, they just sit there two to six inches deep in the soil and then it's the following spring that they come out and mate. How do you recognize their damage? Well, again, wireworms, early season pests, they're feeding directly on the seeds as the seeds germinate. They'll feed on the roots of the seedlings. And so you'll see also some stunting damage, often a wilting flag leaf. Later in the season, and, and again, my experience is more with small grains, wheat and barley, but even later in the season when those wheat plants are getting larger, you'll see damage in, up in this top right hand corner here. You'll see the flag leaf is, is drying out and wilting. And that's because the wireworm isn't feeding on the roots anymore. It's actually chewed right into the stem. Maybe they're looking for some moisture or it's an easy place to chew right at soil level. So 
again, they cause a variety of damage. And, and if you're, even if you're looking at, uh, say, melon crops, for example, or even strawberries, fruits that touch the ground, wireworms will chew into fruits where they touch the ground. Um, of course, if you're growing any kind of tuber crop, potatoes, carrots, or whatever, they'll chew into those um, and, and create um, uh, holes and damage in that way. So if you're looking at a early season soil insect that's killing the seeds, killing the small seedlings, what you're seeing are, are patchy bare areas in the field. So here we're looking at an irrigated pivot in Montana. This was uh, wheat, spring wheat. And you can see the bare patches in the field that are all a result of wireworm damage. One of the interesting things, again, is their biology. They like that irrigated soil. You can draw a line along the drip line of the irrigated pivot. This neighboring field was dry land, but it was planted within two days uh, of the irrigated field. So wireworms do like irrigated, continuously cropped fields, or their populations do well under those situations. But we also see their populations reach high levels in dry land uh, uh, fields in Montana. So here again, we're looking at large areas of patchy stand development in a dry land spring wheat field. As I mentioned earlier, crop rotation isn't very effective. They might prefer um, cereal crops, grass crops. Uh, but once you have a population built up in your field, they'll feed on and damage pretty much whatever crop you plant. Um, here's a canola field in rotation with spring wheat, and you can see the wire worms uh, you dig up one of the plants in the damaged area, and you can see the wireworms uh, just basically hanging off the roots and feeding. And this is, again, just to give you that example, here's a pulse crop, a lentil field, and rotation with spring wheat. And again, the wireworms, once they're there, they will feed on pretty much uh, <clears throat> any crop that you plant. So before I discuss management, I would like to go back with a, a brief history lesson, and I mentioned John Comstock earlier. John Comstock was one of the was the first, I believe, entomologist in the United States at Cornell University. And in response to, to the fact that wireworms were a problem, uh, he started three years of research and then published a summary of his research in 1891. And in his research, he stated that wireworms are among the most prominent of the pests that infest field crops back at that time, but he was optimistic. So he said, when we began our experiments three years ago, we confidently expected to be able in a short time to tell farmers how to protect their seed and growing crops from these pests. So uh, John Comstock was very optimistic. Well, what happened at the end of his research? Well, he said that we've tried our best and we have failed to discover a single satisfactory method of protecting seed or of destroying immature wireworms in the soil. And the important point here is that that remains the problem today, over 100 years later. Um, protecting your crop from the damage caused by the wireworms in the soil and trying to reduce or kill those, the populations or kill those wireworms in the soil are, are two of the challenges that we still face today. And then at the end, um, I thought it was kind of uh, funny that uh, John Comstock said, it is with pleasure that we turn from this discussion. So it seems like he felt a little defeated. And I will um, present this slide to producers in Montana. And one of the, one of the astute producers in, in the audi audience noted that uh, in a few years, I might look like uh, John Henry. And, and in fact, I have to say that the wireworms have had some effect on me. So very challenging insect pests when you have them in your field at high numbers. Uh, to finish the webinar presentation this morning, I'll talk a bit about management. I think one of the most important aspects is to know what's going on in your field, to scout for wireworms, because they do tend to be um, a pest of the site. You can scout before crop emergence to determine economic thresholds, to determine if you need a seed treatment. Um, you can also scout after emergence, uh, because that's very helpful to know if those bare patchy areas in your field are in fact caused by wireworms. Because then you'll, be, you'll have time to prepare for the following year because you, you know, you, you're fairly sure they'll be present at some level in the next year. Good idea to save them in alcohol. So in the lab we can get ethanol, but 
you can use isopropyl alcohol, rubbing alcohol from the drugstore. And if you save some of those larvae, if you find them, you can send them to your local extension entomologist to see if they can help you determine the species. Because again, depending on where you are, every region will have a different species complex that might have specific management recommendations. How do you scout for them? The most common way is to put some sort of attractive bait into the soil that attracts them. And you want to do this again, either you can do it before you plant, but often before you plant, the soil is cold, so the results are a little more variable because of the cold soil. But if you um, put these baits in during crop establishment, you can choose those thin patchy areas of your field, um, and then that bait will, uh, will attract the wireworms. The other thing that you can do is you can simply dig around the roots in those thin patchy areas of the field. As I pointed out in one of the previous slides, uh, during crop establishment, if those wireworms are feeding, especially when the soil is moist, um, you'll find them around the roots. So what do you do if you know that you have wireworms in your field? Um, one of the difficulties, they're a very difficult pest to manage. Um, long life cycle in the soil, very hard to kill, very resilient. Um, cultural practices in general are not very effective. Crop rotation generally is not very effective, at least once the populations are high. You may want to, in our region, uh, if you continuously plant spring wheat on your irrigated field for you know, 10, 15 years in a row, you're at the highest risk for uh, developing higher populations of wireworms. Um, so you know, if you do rotate, you might delay the development of problems in your field. Once you have wireworms in your field, they're going to damage pretty much any crop that you plant after that, with the exception of alfalfa. Um, in our region, a lot of producers that have irrigated pivots, you know, alfalfa is not as attractive economically to plant. But if you do plant alfalfa, it's not damaged by wireworms. Uh, large taproot, it can tolerate the feeding. And after a five to seven year rotation with alfalfa, you might, you should, you'll, you'll reduce the numbers of wireworms in the soil because they don't prefer alfalfa. But unfortunately, you're unlikely to get rid of all of them. Again, you know, they can feed on a large variety of, of things in the soil. So you'll reduce their population, but um, they'll probably still be there after a rotation with alfalfa. A couple of uh, small things that you can consider doing. If you have a, you know you have a wireworm field, consider planting that last in the spring. Um, you don't want your crop sitting in the soil for a long period as a seed or a small seedling because those smaller stages are more susceptible to the damage. Um, so if you're planting your crop a little later and it's growing quicker, it has a better chance of growing out of the damage. Same thing with the fall crops. If you can get your fall crop here, winter wheat, for example, if you can get that uh, started a little more in the fall, then it's really going to grow quickly in the spring and you have a better chance of outgrowing that damage. Um, irrigation, what we see with the um, irrigated pivots is that typically, if it's dry land, those wireworms in Montana are starting to go deep in June and July. But when you have irrigation keeps the soil moist, we, we see wireworm activity at the soil surface in July on an irrigated pivot. So the main uh, management recommendation is to protect your crop with insecticidal seed treatments. I'll go over a couple pictures showing you how you can scout. Again, pretty much any type of bait placed in the soil. Um, we use wheat seed. You can mix wheat seed with corn seed. Um, in some regions, you can use potato slices or corn uh, carrot slices. Some sort of bait in the soil um, attracts the wireworms. This stocking trap in our region works very easily because it's easy to put in and pull out. Um, you can simply soak, usually you soak your grain, your wheat, or your corn so that it germinates quickly when you put it in the ground. You could put a handful of wheat seed or corn seed just in a hole in the ground and that will attract them. But this stocking is, is a nice easy method where it contains the seed. So this is just um, uh, a foot stocking and you can fill it with half a cup of wheat seed. You soak the stocking in water the night before, and then you, you put it maybe six inches deep in the soil, 
and you come back seven to 14 days later and the seed is germinating within the stocking and it's attracted wireworms. Uh, this black plastic on the ground, um, there is a recommendation very early in the spring that you might increase your trap catches by warming things up a bit, putting the black plastic to warm things up. But in general, I find I just put the, the bait stockings in without the black plastic to make it easier. So if you were to come back, you've, you've, you put your uh, stocking into the field, your bait bag, uh, you mark it with a flag so you can find it again. Uh, a string is nice. So you can tie the stocking with a string because then again, it's easier to find the stocking when you go to dig it up. And you go back seven to 14 days later and you'll see that uh, the seed, these are roots where the seed has started to germinate. There's a little bit of soil attached. And then you'll find, here's a wireworm right here. They'll just be in that soil and root zone area of that bait bag. And then here's a closer up version where you see that wireworm is actually chewing into the stocking. So if you take this bait bag and, and you, shake, uh, you shake some of the loose dirt off onto a plastic sheet or something, you'll see the wireworms um, uh, fall onto that sheet from the bait bag. Economic thresholds, really, um, I suggest to producers, you know, your experience is, is the best bet. So if you have some patchy areas in your field and you use the seed treatment and, and you have a good idea of how effective it is. Um, but what we do recommend, the more wireworms you have, the higher the rate you want to go with your seed treatment. And so this is one set of recommendations that I think are pretty accurate for our area. Um, but every area and every crop will be slightly different. But the point is, if you find an average of even one wireworm per trap, you probably want to use some sort of seed treatment. Uh, but maybe it's at the lower label rate. As you find more wireworms and you start to find two to, an average of two to four per trap before you plant, then you're going to expect your damage to be higher and the recommendation is to go with a higher end of the label rate for whatever seed treatment you're using. I put this uh, slide in here. Bob Vernon is in uh, British Columbia. He's done a, he's, he's been battling wireworms for a few decades and has done a lot of research. This slide illustrates a little bit what the, what the challenge is um, with some of the current seed treatments. Um, the neonicotinoids like imidacloprid, thiamethoxam, clothianidin are products that are available. Um, and this LC50, it's the, it's the amount of insecticide to kill wireworms. And this comes from uh, Bob's published research. And you can see the point is lindane was used in our region for many decades um, before it was removed from the market. And lindane was inexpensive and it tended to cause about 50% mortality of the larvae each year. Um, but what Bob found with the neonicotinoids, they give good protection. So you get good crop protection. But the mortality is not as great as other insecticides like Lindate. Fipronil is not available. I think it was available for a little while on corn. It, the only crop that it's registered is potatoes. But just as an example from Bob's research, you can see how very little Fipronil is required uh, to kill a, a wireworm. And the reason this is important is, this is also from Bob's research here. What Bob did was he, he this was with wheat crops, and he treated the seed with these different insecticides. Then he would go back a year later to the same area that he treated and he would measure how many wireworms were in the field. And so you can see that the, um, the neonicotinoid type insecticides tended not to reduce the number of wireworms compared to what you would find with fungicide only. And then lindane um, would reduce them about 50%. And if you think a few decades ago, if lindane was inexpensive and you, you treated your seed every year for three years and you killed 50% of the wireworms every year, well, you would clean your field out pretty quickly. And fipronil was a product that Bob was researching and, and promoting, um, but uh, it doesn't appear that this product will become available for, for wireworms. Again, it's only registered on potatoes. But this would be an example of what the goal is. The goal is to hopefully in the future have a product that will protect the crop as well as kill some of the wireworms so that uh, in the following years, their numbers are reduced. 
And just to finish up, uh, to give you an example, this is some research from Washington State. Aaron Esser does a lot of great work in Washington State. And here's an example of increasing rates of uh, thiamethoxam seed treatment on spring wheat. And one of the reasons earlier in the slide I showed you the economic threshold, and I mentioned that if you have more wireworms, we recommend increasing the label rate of the insecticide. And this is a really nice illustration from Aaron's work of why. And you can see that increasing from a quarter ounce to a half ounce to a full ounce um, of seed treat increased the yield of spring wheat. Um, however, again, when Aaron went back there and counted the number of wireworms, he wasn't necessarily decreasing the number of wireworms, but he was increasing the yield. So it does seem that when you have more wireworms in the field, increasing the rate of the seed treatment will be helpful. I'm going to finish my talk there and turn it back over to Julie, and I think later we'll have some time for questions. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much, Kevin. You got a lot of good um, data and research there. I also had to laugh. It's good to see that uh, stockings are more useful than just for aesthetics. So, <laughs> um, anyways, uh, we're going to go ahead and move into the roundtable part of our part, and uh, um, where David and Mitch are going to join us. Um, so, I'm going to take a minute to introduce both of them. David Bellis is responsible for managing the potatoes, pulse crops, and sugar beets. Prior to, prior to his role in seed care, David was sent into his research and development scientist in Arizona and Southern California for seven years. During that time, he intensively tested Syngenta seed care products, including Evicta, nematicide, and Cruiser insecticide. He earned his bachelor's degree in plant protection and his master's degree in weed science, both from the University of Idaho. He went on to earn a doctorate in weed science from Colorado yeah. State. Thanks for joining us today, David. Thank you. Then we, and that brings us to, to Mitch. Uh, as product lead for BASF Seed Solutions, Mitch Stam analyzes the field trial outcomes and makes recommendations to BASF global, regional, and U.S. marketing teams to advance seed treatment technology through the pipeline. Mitch joined BASF in 2014, just after earning his doctorate degree from the University of Nebraska, where he also earned his master's in entomology. So that brings us to our first uh, question. It is, um, it's being reported in the media that wireworm populations are on the rise. And I've seen some articles in Indiana and then they're in the northern states and, and even moving uh, west into uh, kind of the Great Plains a little bit. I wanted to know, are you seeing this in your area of work and is it specific to a geography or more widespread? And so, David, I'll let you start, start, start us off. Okay, thank you. Uh, that's a great question. We have been seeing increases in wireworm populations. And I think that Kevin touched on some of the reasons why. One of the reasons being that the elimination of, of lindane as a control mechanism, which previously had been controlling and reducing the wireworm populations in the field, uh, controlling those uh, neonate states was one of the main reasons. Uh, there's been some other uh, reasons that possibly could contribute to this, and those include some of the cropping practices, such as some no-till uh, rotations, as well as soil erosion control techniques and the use of CRP land, which is a grassland and which, the, which really favors the, the wireworm habitat. So I think those are uh, some of the reasons that we have seen increases in populations. As to the geography, I think it's been pretty much widespread over the entire area where, where wireworms uh, have naturally or historically been an issue. Thanks, David. Mitch, do you have anything uh, to add there? Are you seeing it in any different geographies or anything that would be kind of out of the normal realm? Yeah, sure, uh, Julia. Thanks for having me. Um, we are obviously we're um, 
very interested in the cereals region because as Kevin kind of highlighted, it's been a historical problem for a number of years now. Um, we continue to hear about it being a problem up in the Pacific Northwest area, um, but it has been interesting within really the last one to two years uh, from talking with our field reps and some of our customers. We are beginning to, um, it's showing up in other wheat growing regions of the U.S., uh, primarily like North Dakota, we're hearing more about it. Um, so this might be due to spread of the pest, but also just core awareness as well. Um, we're also hearing it about, as, as Kevin said, it's difficult to, uh, crop rotations are not always effective. And so it is showing up now in additional crops like uh, pulses that, again, Kevin mentioned. Um, again, I live in North Carolina, so specific to this state, which is um, kind of interesting too with that, you know, that CRP land. Um, growers are now, you know, converting some of this um, virgin ground into sweet potato production, and they're having really big problems as a result um, and not having a lot of control options either. So you know, at BASF, we're very aware that wireworms are a problem in uh, lots of crops, and we'll continue to track and look for solutions. Yeah, your response got me thinking a little bit about here um, with the uh, promotion or, you know, the um, encouragement for farmers to be planting uh, cover crops and for those acres to, um, or for, for, the, for farmers to increase their adoption of cover crops. Um, does that present more of a challenge or a more friendly environment to wireworms? Well, um, what I would say, Julie, is that I think what we're finding, in, and David and Mitch mentioned some good points, and uh, the point about no-till, for example, um, anything that improves the soil conditions, which, are, which, which can be good, also improve the environment for the wireworm. So anything that improves soil moisture or maybe the diversity of food sources um, will favor larger populations. So uh, I would have to, I would think that cover cropping would, in, would, would be one of those factors that would improve soil conditions for wireworm. I, I, would, I would add also that if you're using a cover crop for soil uh, control or something and then you would happen to burn it down and till it down right before you plant your crop, you're going to have a lot of organic matter in the soil that's going to be de uh, decomposing and releasing a lot of CO2 that's going to really draw the wireworms up to, your, to the crop that you're planting into. And so you may want to consider how you're managing your cover crop uh, versus planting your, your economic crop that you're tr trying to grow. You know, that's that's really interesting to consider. So especially yeah, as you as you manage multiple crops and and look to uh do some different uh maybe planting techniques or rotation rotation of different crops as, as farmers look to explore those different things. Um, from Kevin, from your perspective, should farmers be concerned about wire worm populations, particularly particularly this year because of uh, the weather patterns we're seeing this spring, and uh, um, if so, is is it too late for them to do anything? Well, you know, I I don't wire worms again because they're a below ground pest aren't it, aren't influ influenced as much by the above ground weather conditions. So, you know, we don't necessarily see um, outbreak, you know, cycling of outbreaks like you might see with an above ground pest. So I don't think there's anything particular about this spring that would concern a person. What we do see, um, it does affect their behavior. So for example, um, in Montana, I've seen some year, we've, we've had a lot of uh, moisture this spring, a lot of snow. So we're gonna have a lot of uh, uh, standing water in the field. So I've seen situations where we've planted a trial and the wheat begins to grow, but there's some standing water, the, the soil is very moist, and the wireworms aren't coming up to feed because there, presumably there's not enough oxygen with the, with, the, with the standing water. But as soon as that water starts to drain, then um, they came up and began damaging the crop. So I guess the way I would answer that is if there's any particular uh, spring conditions in, in different regions of the country, um, how those spring conditions are affecting the soil conditions in terms of moisture particularly. So if you're in an area where there, there's a drought and, there's not, and you're dry land and there's not enough rain, fewer wireworms are going to come up when the soil is really dry. 
Um, if there's too much water, um, you know, they may not come up until the, the soil conditions are better. So um, as to uh, what they can do to protect their crop this spring, really um, there are no rescue treatments uh, for most of the crops, meaning once your crop is planted, there aren't a lot of treatments to, um, that you can apply after your crop is planted. So pretty much depends on um, either a seed treatment or some crops may have uh, soil incorporations or in furrow sprays that are registered. Um, but once your crop is planted, probably the best thing you can do would be to survey any potential damage areas to get an idea of whether or not you have wireworms and what species you have after your crop is planted. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, Dave, do you have anything to add to that? I'm sorry, did you say David? Yes, I did. Okay, sorry. Uh, I had a, you know, uh, Kevin explained the situation very well. Those wireworms are going to be in the soil uh, down lower in the profile over winter and the, the soil conditions that uh, at the time of planting will determine really the number of pop wireworms that come up and feed on that. So if you have uh, good soil moisture and planting conditions, that's perfect for planting as well as for wireworms to come up. Generally, we say that soil moisture temperatures to about 50 degrees. When it gets to about 50 degrees, then the wireworms will start coming up to feed. And uh, the cool, damp weather uh, really brings them to the surface. Uh, if it gets hot and dry, like you said, it'll drive them back down, so they'll quit feeding at that point. So you might get a period of feeding, and then it warms up and gets hot and dry, and then they'll, they'll go back down and quit feeding. Um, so another thing we know is that wireworms actually love, you know, summer fallow, and it really has no effect on their, their feeding, so it can be even worse the following year uh, following a summer fallow field. And like Kevin said, really the only thing you can do is to use the appropriate seed treatment at planting uh, at this time. Thanks, David. So, so obviously wireworms are extremely resilient and, uh, um, and living in the soil before they um, morph into adults for two to seven years, depending on the species. Why, why are they so resilient? What makes them, um, you know, kind of uh, impossible to kill, so to speak? And uh, anybody can well, jump in and take that. Oh, well, I'll, I'll jump in, Julie. Um, you know, this is largely from, from my observations, but, you know, I think there are different aspects of the physiology of this insect as well as, as, well as its behavior. If you're an insect that has to survive for two to seven years in the soil, um, in general, I don't think of the soil as maybe a super, I mean, there are times where there could be a lot of food sources, but there are going to be uh, times where there aren't, where, where, where food is limited or, you know, for example, the soil conditions dry up to the surface, they have to go deeper, there's less food deeper in the soil. So I, I think they've had to adapt to a situation where they can go dormant, for example, they can go long. I, you know, I, I would imagine that they, they have, you know, the ability to go temporarily dormant during um, periods where the soil conditions are not favorable. Um, and that probably just makes them a little, little, little harder to kill. And they've also d developed behaviors to find suitable areas in the soil and avoid areas of the soil um, that are not favorable to them. And so I think that makes them physiologically um, difficult, but also it's just a matter that they're below ground and they can move a lot and they can survive for periods without food that probably make them particularly difficult to kill. I would also add there's a lot of genetic diversity within the wireworm as a whole. And Kevin alluded to that with the, just the plethora of numbers of species that are out there and also the different sizes that the that those are different sizes of the wireworms. So you're not just dealing with a single species uh, that we can focus on. There's a huge population there with a lot of genetic diversity that we have to try to deal with. And I think that adds yeah, to Yeah, that's that. a very good point. And this is Mitch. I would just say kind of highlighting Kevin's, uh, I guess, second to last slide with, um, you know, the old chemistries. I mean, for 40 plus years, they were getting, you know, great control with those 
organochlorines and organophosphates, and obviously they were very toxic and had a tough uh, uh, toxicological profile. But I mean, we were controlling, and it was just kind of with the next generation of toxins that are just a little bit less effective than um, what previously was available. I'd just like to give the audience one example before you move on. Um, Bob Vernon had done some research where the neonicotinoids, when the insect, when the wireworm ingests them, they can become paralyzed. So they may not die, but they can become paralyzed. So in one of Bob's experiments, he took, he would take the wireworms after they became paralyzed, he'd set them aside in some soil with some food and wait to see if they recovered or if they died. Well, in one case, he had a wireworm that was paralyzed for six months and then recovered. So, you know, I, I just relate that story to producers because to me that's pretty amazing how an insect can survive for six months in, a, in that state without food and then recover. Yeah, that, that's correct on the neonicotinoids. They do uh, have an intoxicating effect on the, on the wireworms, whereas uh, like a pyrethroid has a repellency effect. So it, uh, Bob's done a great job studying this and the effect of the wireworms on different species. He's determined that the intoxication effect is really the main way that these neonicotinoids are working to protect the, the stand. And having a, a product that can stop feeding is not new to in how other insecticides work, uh, even in the foliar applied world. But just to have them stop feeding, give the, 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 the crop a chance to grow and be able to get a good stand, and if it can, you know, protect it for six months, up to six months before it recovers, um, that's giving your your wheat crop the chance then to to grow. Uh, the 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 bad part is that we're not killing the neonates like Kevin alluded to with the older organochlorine compounds, and so that population is not being significantly reduced from year to year, which is uh, starting to show up when we're popping up with these hot spots of wireworms in the field. Yeah, I'm glad that you find that example. So that that is um, just blows my mind that uh, they can live in that state and then and then like you said, recover. Um, Mitch, is your company working on any control strategies in this area? And if so, what? I mean, yeah, we at BSF we've been interested now in control control strategies for wireworms for the um, past several years and. We continue to research it, uh, wireworms. We do have um, research and development timelines in place. Um, this also requires us to uh, uh, clear the necessarily, or get the necessarily regulatory requirements. They must be cleared. So um, for right now, all I can really say is that um, more stuff will be coming from BASF in the coming years, and we will be sharing that information uh, once it's available. And David, how about uh, there at Syngenta? Um, are you guys working on control, new control strategies in this area? Yeah, so we've been a leader in the control of wireworms for a long time uh, with our cruiser uh, products. And we've continued to uh, do research with uh, cooperators to look at the, the rates of, of cruiser that's needed to control wireworms with different populations. We've also been very interested in bringing new technologies to the market, and one of one of the key species that we have on our radar is is wireworms. So we're actively screening compounds for control of wireworms. Uh, we've previously announced that one of our compounds in development, one of the key targets is wireworms for that for that uh, compound. But like uh, Mitch said, there's a lot of regulatory hurdles and different hurdles that we have to go through to make sure that this can come to fruition. So at this time, that's about um, as much information as I can give. But we're very hopeful that we will uh, be able to uh, help growers in, in the future. Great. That gets me thinking a little bit as I've listened to both of your answers and um, some of the other articles that I've been working on. Are there any other insects that feed on wireworms? Well, um you know, it's very difficult because they're below ground. Um, below ground, you know, there's not a whole lot of information. Um, I know there aren't very many natural diseases. There was a study out of Europe where an insect uh, uh, pathology person, invertebrate uh, pathology person looked at, I believe it was thousands of wild collected wireworms in Europe, 
and the disease rate was, you know, two or three percent. Um, I think the m probably more common predation might be eggs on the surface, so some ground beetles that might uh, scavenge the eggs on the surface. And in the case of the adults, birds would be um, would be a, a primary um, predator. Well, while we're in between questions here. Um, to our audience, I forgot to mention earlier that if you have any questions for our panelists um, as we go through these questions or um, from Kevin's presentation, please go ahead and type those into the chat box and we will um, get to those during our Q&A session, uh, which we are um, it's, uh, we're, get, we're about there, so I didn't realize um, as much time had passed as it has. So. Uh, we will begin to wrap up our roundtable discussion here um, after one more question. There's been a lot of discussion about different types of management practices um, that can be done uh, that are non-chemical related as well as um, some of the chemicals. Um, are there, is there anything that maybe we haven't talked about in terms of management that you think is important to uh, speak to or to bring up? And so Mitch, I'll let you start. Uh, yeah, thanks, Julie. As I was kind of thinking about this, and obviously we're BSF, we're a chemical company, but we also try to encourage use of um, you know non-chemical management for control of various pests, including wireworms. So I did go through the literature, and I do have one slide I can share with you. Um, maybe there we go. Um, to, was looking. Um, there's some great resources out there, uh, especially from the Washington State University. Uh, website. Uh, Kevin mentioned um, Aaron Esser. He's uh, very instrumental out there, and he had a little bit of information. Again, the crop rotations may or not be effective, but um, you mentioned that uh, wheat tends to be a slightly more preferred host than barley for whatever reason. Um, same thing with the pulse crops. The, the chickpea and the lentils are um, more suitable than field peas. Uh, he also recommended if you're dealing with a high wireworm population, you know, seed at the end of that the planting window as temperatures or soil temperatures are being, getting too warm, hopefully the wireworms will be getting moved down into the soil profile, and therefore that might be a more uh, better time to plant to reduce some of that feeding. Uh, increasing the seeding rate you recommended, and then trying just to manipulate the, just the soil conditions, either soil drying or soil flooding, depending on the wireworm species that you're dealing with. Uh, cultivating and trap crops, possibly early harvest, um, might be options. And he did mention that there are um, biological and beneficial nematodes that can possibly suppress wireworm populations as well. Thanks. David, do you have anything to add to that? Well, I would just add that there's some simple things that probably every grower thinks about that they could do. Uh, one is just the good seed bed preparation and making sure that you have good uh, growing conditions for your crop, and Kevin did allude to that. Also, the, the seeding date is important to make sure that the soil temperature is correct so it gets up and you get a good stand established. One thing that you might think about is the seeding rate, if, uh, you know, making sure that you're using the appropriate seeding rate for your area and your conditions and not trying to cut back on the seeding rates because if you don't plant enough seed, uh, seed to begin with, you'll definitely have a you know thinner stance than you would have otherwise so I think seeding rate would be another really important thing and also the seeding depth making sure that your planters are set correctly to get the appropriate seeding depth that the the crop can jump out of the ground and it's not struggling and uh, being attacked by wireworms in the process so those are uh, those are the four things that we really talk about and recommend in our in our when we talk about wireworm with cultural control that wraps up our roundtable discussion portion of the webinar, and so we're going to go ahead and move into the question and answer session with uh, you, our participants. And at this time, if you do have any questions, please go ahead and type those in the chat box, and uh, um, we'll get those asked of our speakers. So the first one is, uh, um, I think, a great question: is how do infer or soil treatments compare to seed treatments uh, for control? And so, um, Kevin, I'll let you take a first stab at that. Okay, great. Thanks, Julie. Um, in furrow, I believe uh, most of the products that I'm familiar with would be in the pyrethroid class. There may be others. Um, 
pyrethroids, um, as David mentioned earlier, are, are, have a repellency. So um, what we found, at least with the pyrethroid class of inferro applications, um, is that they can give good protection. But again, the wireworms, they're giving good protection because the wireworms are avoiding that area. So if you have an inferro spray of a pyrethroid, um, the, the wireworms during uh, seed germination and while that seedling is small are avoiding that area of the soil. Um, and the, it would be a similar uh, with a soil incorporation where you're spraying the soil. And then I believe the idea with the soil incorporation is you're trying to really flip the soil in a way that you're, you're not mixing it too much, but you're creating, you're trying to get that layer. So pyrethroids don't move in the soil, they bind to the soil. So you can't really water them in. So uh, if you're using a pyrethroid across the entire field, the idea is you're, you're using a cultivation method where you're trying to flip the soil so that you're creating like a barrier of the pyrethroid that is in the seed zone. So that wireworms are deep, as they come up, they, they, the pyrethroid is kind of like, you know, it's going to bother them. It's an irritant. Um, it's a contact um, activity that will, will cause them to be irritated and they're going to want to avoid coming up to that seed zone. So in general, my impression is that you can get good protection, but again, uh, the mortality effect will be similar to the seed treatments if it's a pyrethroid. Thanks, Kevin. David or Mitch, do you have anything to add? I think that growers really appreciate the convenience of a seed treatment, and so that's why they're so popular, and it's, it's quite easy for them. Also, the application rates are controlled by the certified seed applicator. And in furrow applications, I, I think, are difficult in some crops versus others. Uh, I think it's a lot easier in a row crop like potatoes than it would be in a, in a cereal crop or a canola. And, um, but if you were able to put the product in the soil uh, like, like that, it, it would be effective. But in, in many cases, we don't have labels also that would cover the in furrow applications for, for many of the crops that the wireworms are, are a problem in, like, such as cereals. Thank you. Um, the next question is that um, there seems to be some indication that using higher TMX in two consecutive years that wireworm populations decrease. Is this a good practice? What was the product, uh, Julie? It says TMX, but I'm guessing that might be a, an abbreviation for thiamethoxate. Thiam uh, Am I saying um, that right? Yes. Thank you. Yes. That's an abbreviation for thiamethoxam? I'm guessing. Okay. And I'm sorry, could you repeat the question once more for us? Sure. It says there seemed to be an indication or some indication that using higher levels of um, that uh, ingredient in two consecutive years that wire worm populations decrease. Is this a good practice? If somebody interprets that question differently, please let me know. Or uh, yes, he did clarify that it is thiamethoxam. Okay, I'll, great. I'll, uh, well, go, go ahead, Kev. Oh, are you? Okay, so well, I'll jump in, and, and I'm sure uh, David will have some similar observations, maybe. Um, and again, they've done a lot of this research in Washington State, and we've done some here in Montana. Uh, we have to be careful, you know, I don't want to give the impression that there's no mortality from the neonicotinoids. There is some mortality, but what we find is the mortality is variable, and I think Bob Vernon found this also. Um, in some of the trials that I've conducted, I've seen up to 30% mortality uh, from seed treatments of thiamethoxam applied to spring wheat. Um, so, and then you're going to see more of a mortality effect from thiamethoxam if you increase the rates. So is it a good practice? Um, I would say that, you know, right now, I, I am not aware of a seed treatment that's registered that will have a high mortality effect. Um, generally, I, I would suggest that if, 
you're detecting uh, significant numbers of wireworms or you're detecting wireworms in your field, starting with a higher rate rather than a lower rate is probably a good strategy because you have a better chance of having a mortality effect. The other complicating factor is the mortality effect will depend on the species of wireworm. Some wireworms, there'll be a little more mortality in response to the thiamethoxam than other species that are a little more resilient to the, to the insecticide. That would be my observations anyway. This, yeah, thanks, Kevin. This is David. I, I would just add in the consecutive year part, it, you know, as, as you think about this pest and the life cycle of it, those, those uh, wireworms remain in the soil and they're not coming in as an annual flight every year. So using it uh, consecutive years in my mind would help with the control of it just because you're continuing to apply on the pressure to those wireworms, you know, each year and um, trying to reduce the population and not let them recover. So it's a little different than if it was an aphid flight coming in new every year. And the other factor, um, you know, I think this was brought up earlier that uh, with the thymethoxam applied, they're not feeding on the crop. And so you're getting crop protection, but you're reducing their ability to feed. So over the long term of several years of having a little bit of a mortality effect in reducing their feeding, you should reduce their population. I think the, the difficulty comes in that wireworms are really difficult to predict. And in, in our position where we're trying to give recommendations to a producer, we like to have a certain degree of certainty about the outcome. And with wireworms, that's very difficult. So in general, I would say, I, I would say that's a reasonable strategy, but then it, it, it may also flip back to economics in terms of the cost benefit. Um, but it, it, it's always, I'm always hesitant um, because you'll turn around and see the same situation with totally different results depending on the field and the species of wireworm. Great, thank you. That's a, those are some really good points and uh, I love that discussion there around that question um, that came in. So I've got two more questions I just want to try to quickly answer if we can. And uh, um, so the first one is, and Kevin, I'll this to you. In Montana, are there some years that certain wireworm populations greatly decline naturally? And are there any dollar amounts from wireworm damage in Montana and also across the U.S.? Uh, the second question was dollar amounts? Yeah, economic damage. Okay. Um, as to different species um, cycling in populations in Montana, it, it's, it's very, there's very little research has been done on the biology of a lot of these wireworms because in, in after the 50s and a lot of the potent organochlorines that were mentioned earlier, they weren't a problem, so there wasn't a need for research. Um, we don't know a lot about the biology and ecology um, of the different species, so it's, it's, it's quite a bit of an unknown. I would, I would guess that we're going to see more fluctuations in the species with a shorter life cycle. So we have Hypnoides bicolor in Montana, which probably has a two-year cycle. So that may be uh, fluctuate a little more with the weather. But the short answer is we, we don't know. Um, as far as economic damage goes, again, we don't have a good handle on that. We did do a survey four or five years ago, um, but uh, we don't have a good estimate of the area that's infested with wireworms. My, my impression of wireworms is that they're still not extremely widespread, at least in Montana, Washington State, they, they may be more widespread. But when a producer does have wireworms in their field, the economic significance is severe. Um, but how many producers are affected, we don't have that information. Thanks, Kevin. Sounds like we could do another on, you know, what do we not know and, and what, what areas could use more research and um, investment uh, from from universities as well as companies. So um, uh, the last question that I want to ask, and for our participants, if I did not get to your question, um, I will email that to our speakers and to um, ask them to, to respond and, and get those answers back to you. So the last question I have from our, our um, audience today is if there's any indication of resistance developing to neonics. So anybody 
can jump in on that. Uh, uh, this is David. I, I do not have any uh, data that would say that the LC50s are have changed with uh, with the neonicotinoids over time, but uh, we continue to monitor that, and we do have the baseline data that Bob Vernon did with his his work. But I don't have any indication that the neo there's resistance developing. It seems to be that the populations are have just been increasing. Okay. Mitch or Kevin, you know anything different? No, I would agree with that. Yeah, me too. And I would just say I mean, wire worms, as Kevin discussed, they have a longer life cycle. They're not it's not the same as like, you know, thrips or aphids that are uh, reproducing very quickly and thus increasing the chances of insecticide resistance. So Again, I have not seen anything that would suggest that there's new and resistance with wireworms. Thank you very much to you, Kevin, David, and Mitch for um, taking the time to join us today and to share your expertise. And uh, to our, our participants, we hope that you found this information of value. And again, a Thank you to BASF and Syngenta for their sponsorship of this strategy series. Also, I'd like you to mark your calendars for our next webinar, which will be June 21st at 12 Central, and we'll be talking about safety and stewardship as it relates to seed treatment operations. As a note, this webinar has been recorded and will be made available on seedworld.com within 24 hours. That's all for today. Thanks again for joining us. This is Julie Deering signing off.